Okay, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us for April case reviews. As a monthly reminder, this information is confidential and privileged. It's protected by the HIPAA Act, and you should not share it or distribute it um, because it's protected. All right, moving on to case one. This is a case of a 41-year-old female. EMS was contacted for an unconscious party. Um, when they arrived, the patient was unresponsive. Her airway was open, but she wasn't protecting it. She was pale, warm, dry, although she also had no pulses, no evidence of active bleeding. Initial vital signs were obtained shortly after patient contact noted that her heart rate was zero. No blood pressure was obtainable. Her respiratory rate was zero, and she was estimated to be about 54 kilos. No past medical history was available. Um, but medications were, and they include cyclobenzaprine, so flexoril, fluoxetine, common for depression, hydroxyzine, um, either for itching or anxiety. And the information provided to EMS was from her daughter. I believe it was her adult daughter, but I'm not sure. Daughter found patient unconscious, unresponsive, naked in her own room. Um, the daughter stated that about 30 minutes prior to her finding her in this condition, she got a text message from her mom saying that her throat was scratchy and her daughter had shared that uh, she was using whippets that night. This call started at 316 in the morning um, and two minutes into it, they documented, documented a heart rate of 125, no blood pressure and a respiratory rate of zero, but I believe that that was probably an error as they were still doing CPR. Um, they initiated suctioning at three minutes, um, they placed an OPA and a bag valve mask. They noted that when they got on scene, PD was already on scene performing CPR and that their AED had told them not to shock. Um, law enforcement also gave two doses of Narcan, assuming that's two milligrams each, so four milligrams, but unclear. And um, there was further report that she may have taken a large amount of ibuprofen. Uh, there was no description in the narratives about where that information came from or um, any support of that. At five minutes, they placed an, ice, an IV in her antecubital area and they gave her 250 cc's of IV fluids. They placed an eye gel at a 4.0 and at six minutes, they, they documented the first rhythm check, which was asystole and they gave her one milligram of epi. At nine minutes, they rechecked her pulse and she had no pulse. Her rhythm was asystole. They gave her another milligram of epi. And at 13 minutes, <clears throat> they exchanged the 4O eye gel because they felt that the end title wasn't reading properly and it may have been too um, small. And they got a better reading off of that one. <clears throat> at 16 hey, Dr. minutes. Dr. Gadbois, sorry to yeah. interrupt you. I apologize, okay. but I think we lost your screen. Probably when whoever just. Yeah, that happens. Uh, screen broadcast. I don't know if I'm just going to stop. I'm going to reshare. Yeah. That usually works best. Is that better? Yep, we got it back. Great. <clears throat> and then at 16 minutes, they got ROSC. Um, they document a heart rate of 136 a blood pressure 101 over 69, a respiratory rate of 12, end title of 15, and her GCS is three. I put in, in parentheses in C, that CPR because in the in the flow sheet, it seems like she just, just she got ROSC and that was it. But in the narrative, it said that she got ROSC, then lost it, had to do CPR for a little bit more, and then reachieved ROSC, although in the flow sheet, it wasn't um, clear where she got the second ROSC. Um, and then the additional information besides her being pulseless and apneic is that they noticed foam coming from her mouth with severe swelling to her lips, her mouth, and her tongue. They noticed that there was a small patch of a burn, a thermal burn to her left elbow. Um, but here's her first 12 lead. It has a bit of artifact in it, but it looks for all intents and purposes to be narrow, complex, potentially tachycardic if you were uh, marching this out. 
no clear evidence of um, T, uh, peak T waves and unclear if it truly is sinus or not based off of lead one where it has less artifact. At 25 minutes, so they waited approximately nine minutes on scene um, before transporting to ensure that she wasn't going to re-arrest again and initiated transport. At 26 minutes, they assessed her vital signs. Uh, again, her heart rate now is 101. Her blood pressure is 54 over 33. Respiratory rate supported is 12, and her SpO2 is documented as 72% end title of 99 at 29 minutes, they initiated norepi to augment her blood pressure um, in conjunction, assuming that she was running her IV fluids uh, wide open. And at 30 minutes, they reassessed her um, heart rate, uh, similar 99, but blood pressure is better supported at 141 over 115. No respiratory rate was recorded. SpO2 is 81% end title of 99. It's not clear if they felt that this was due to secretions or if they thought this was spurious as I didn't see anything in the narrative um, that documented any interventions, but at 40 minutes, her SpO2 normalizes back to 98%. <clears throat> her heart rate's 96, her blood pressure is 130 over 106, respirators of 12 and end title still um, significantly elevated at 99 and they repeated her 12 lead here. <clears throat> Better tracing. Um, again, looks to be narrow complex, uh, no longer what appears to be tachycardic, and um, I can't, uh, I guess you could say that these were P waves, so sinus and origin. And at 41 minutes, they arrive to, um, I believe it's Peace Health on this one. And then this is just um, a little paraphernalia that may have been there, but I don't know if it was. Um, Pulsera, there was no report that was uh, entered that I could find in Pulsera for this. And then in, re in reviewing the pre-hospital course, <clears throat> I thought that this crew did a really great job of CPR, BLS management, including recognizing difficulties with the SGA, potentially reading the end title incorrectly and then bumping up to a larger size from what I could glean from the report is that they went a smaller size, not sure if they were gonna able to seat it appropriately due to the assessment of airway swelling, um, but were able to reassess and not just completely gloss over that and uh, place a larger SGA that was probably more appropriate for her body habitus. Um, and then post Ross care that they got Rosk, they didn't immediately leave. They got 12 lead, tw uh, two, at least one 12 lead on scene, another one in route. Management of hypotension aggressively, and the documentation that they had in their chart was pretty good. Um, the only areas for improvement is this airway swelling. Could this have been um, anaphylaxis, or was it related to the whippets that she was inhaling? Not clear. So in the hospital, her daughter arrived and said that she was complaining of shortness of breath and angioedema. Um, I'm not sure if that was in person or if that was via the text message. Nonetheless, the the emergency room um, team treated her with solimedrol, Benadryl, and Pepsid. Um, she, when she arrived, she was hypotensive, 60 over 47. So they gave her IV fluids and started her on an epidrip. Her labs were significant for mildly low potassium and elevated. Uh, I think I have to do this again. So hold on. Mark, do you know why it keeps on switching over? I do not. Okay. I will you can do look is into that. Share, if you share the window that you're using rather than the screen, sometimes that can help. Mm. It's what I've been doing before, but um, if it happens again, I'll make sure it's the window. So her creatinine was a little bit elevated for her age. Um, her kidney was a little injured, you could think of it as. And then uh, she was positive for tricyclics on her urine drug screen. Her liver enzymes were a little bit elevated. She was pretty acidotic with a pH of 6.63. And her uh, CO2 levels based off of her gas were pretty elevated at 150. Um, lactate was also quite elevated at 12.7. Uh, 
because of the limited amount of history available, they got a CT of her head and a CT of her chest, abdomen, pelvis to try to figure out if there was any other contributing factors to her cardiac arrest. Um, those were all interpreted as negative. And I believe she was, if I remember correctly, I think she was February 2nd. So um, three days after hospitalization, she wasn't improving. They did an MRI of her brain, which showed a pretty diffuse agnostic brain injury. So she was placed on comfort care during that um, time in between. They thought she might have some seizure activity. So they started her on anti-epileptic therapy and um, they withdrew. They put her in comfort care and she had passed not too long afterwards. Um, I don't remember the exact day or hospital day for that. <clears throat> so kind of a pretty profound case of a relatively young person who was using some paraphernalia, but was it the paraphernalia that caused her to have this airway involvement or her cardiac arrest, or was it completely unrelated? Um, so I thought I'd look into whippets a little bit to see if maybe there was any case studies about anaphylaxis or airway swelling. Um, from my finding, there isn't. But I thought this is a good opportunity to talk about this as it's not the first time that I've heard of people using whippets. So whippets are nitrogen oxide um, canisters like this image over here. And there's they can be found in um, normal day activity as a medical use for anesthetic or for pain control, a fuel booster for uh, cars or vehicles. And then in the food industry as a propellant, you can think of it as like um, a whip or um, I can't think of right this moment, another food industry use, but their slang term might be referred to as names. I have not heard of that, but that's what I could find on this topic. They're colorless and tasteless gas, and it's usually abused by inhalation. Either they administer the cartridge in a balloon and inhale from the balloon, or they um, administer the cartridge directly into their mouth. According to a global drug survey, it's the 13th most popular drug of, drug of abuse in the, in the world in that its effect is pretty rapid. Um, it, it diffuses into the bloodstream and goes to the brain pretty quickly. They say within 30 seconds and it lasts for one minute. Um, and the feelings that people might report are euphoria, excitement, happiness, heightened consciousness, change in mood, dissociation, and then when mixed with other drugs, they can cause hallucinations. Um, potential risks of using whippets in the short term are going to be cold injuries. Apparently, as they get administered from these cartridges or canisters, they can, I believe I read that it could go down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So if they have direct contact with the cartridge, they could have frostbite injuries to their nose, their lips, their throat, their hands, like their fingertips. And then even in one particular um, resource, the vocal cords, if they, um, <clears throat> if they inhale this from a more substantial cartridge, they can cause barotrauma, such as a pneumomediastinum or pneumothorax. And then in larger canisters that may be exposed to heat, they could explode. Long-term effects is B12 deficiency, which um, can lead to neuropathy, uh, memory loss, and then other complaints that people might com um, report as ringing in their ears, depression, dependence. Um, it can be a teratogen, and it can also lead to psychosis. So in our protocol, we don't really have whippets, um, and I didn't really think that anaphylaxis would be the most appropriate protocol, so I pulled asystole for this one. So epi, which is patient gut, 1 to 10,000. If asystole persi uh, persists, continue two-minute CPR and rhythm analysis, continue epi every four minutes, which this patient had received. Um, and then a pediatric consideration is going to be weight-based of uh, 0 0.1 mg per kg, repeated every three to five minutes, never to exceed adult dosing. Um, and then I would go on to treating other causes for your asystole. So we have acidosis, cardiac tamponade, considerate, and transport uh, 
um, expeditiously if you're if there's a high probability or high suspicion. Hyperkalemia, which you have management. Hypothermia, which we have management. Hypovolemia, we have pseudo management with IV fluids. Hypoxia, which we have management. Pulmonary emboli, another um, recognize and transport expeditiously. Tension pneumo, which we have management, and toxins, we have management. Anyone have any questions? Concerns, thoughts? This was your case. You wanted to bring any other perspective? I just, I think this is really good management. I think the only, yeah, there was that transient hypotension. Um, was there any documentation about the decision to stay with the supraglottic versus intubation? Or sorry, um, hypoxia. hypoxia. Hypoxia? No, there wasn't yeah. nothing. So, you know, when there was, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if it was real or if it was just um, validated into the chart when it didn't, I, I'm not sure because, you know, there was a heart rate of 125 when they documented that they were doing CPR. So I'm not certain. Um, it's a good point, as in if you can't ventilate with an SGA for whatever reason, then it would be um, it would be a strong consideration to get a definitive airway. But I don't and I, there was no mention to what these issues were in the 26 to the 30, hmm, 26 to who knows, either 40 minutes or not 40 minute, you know, 40 minute mark. Um, but it was transient, at least from what I can gather. And then they didn't have any issues in the hospital setting for um, continued hypoxia. Yeah, I mean, it's transient, but it's, I mean, documented at least like four minutes apart with low, low SpO2. So totally. I, I think maybe you know, it's, it's our, minutes. yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's our, it's our obligation to, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like you, you, you know, you don't have documentation that you're oxygenating the patient well. Um, so, I, you know, if there, if there's some anatomic reason or some, something that you're, that you're not, that you're choosing not to intubate, I think it's reasonable to talk about it. Um, because, I mean, ultimately this, you know, this patient would have zero chance without EMS, but this patient ultimately did have an anoxic brain injury. So, you know, it's, uh, and and she's also, you know, quite hypercarbic. And so, you know, you don't, you've, you've got both hypoxic and hypercarbic respiratory failure. Uh, you definitely have an indication to intubate. Definitely. And in consideration, if you're entering entering vital signs that don't make sense or that you're not acting upon is to um, make sure it's validated correctly or to consider that you're going to have some part of your narrative should be mentioning that if you're not acting upon um, those abnormalities. I think, yeah, the presumption is always going to be that any vital signs entered are correct. And so then the decision making should be based on that. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions or anything in the chat for that one? I don't think so. All right, moving on to the second case. It's a 66-year-old male. EMS got a call for back pain. Um, the patient was found to be alert. His air was open. He was protecting. He was pink, warm, dry, strung regular radial pulse. Vital signs were obtained immediately upon patient contact, noted that his heart rate was 75, his blood pressure was 151 over 107, no respiratory rate was recorded, and SpO2 was 98%. His past medical history included surgery 30 years ago for his back, and no meds were recorded. Um, the history that he provided was that the pain started last night for him, no trauma, he was complaining of low back pain radiating into his groin and his right lower extremity. He rated it as a 7 out of 10. He had some difficulty with urinating, and he said that, you know, this pain has been going on for a couple of months, but tonight, yesterday, was really the worst. EMS made contact at 11.53 in the morning, um, vital signs as uh, reported. And at seven minutes, they get another set of vital signs. He's uh, heart rate of 62, still hypertensive at 149 over 99, respiratory rate of 20, and SATs of 99%. At 12 minutes, they get a line. They give him 300 cc's of IV fluids. At 13 minutes, they give him 15 milligrams of Toradol. 
And at 17 minutes, they do another set of vital signs. Uh, he's a little bradycardic at 57, blood pressure 150 over 100, respirators of 20, and his room air sats are 99%. They initiate transport at 19 minutes. At 27 minutes, they get another set of vital signs, heart rate now 61, blood pressure 147 over 103, no respiratory rate recorded, and SPO2 of 100%. Due to ongoing pain, they gave him another another dose of pain management. At 29 minutes, they got 100 micrograms of fentanyl, and he reported that the pain reduced from seven down to a three. And then they arrived at the hospital at 44 minutes. Um, they document that the patient was moved to a wheelchair upon ER arrival, sitting in security area. He was witnessed to have a sinkhole episode, which um, bought him a direct room. So. There's no report if for Pulsera as this went to Legacy Salmon Creek before Pul um, Pulsera was enacted, but they did document in their chart that they did a code one green to um, the hospital. <clears throat> and then in review, um, this was referred to uh, case reviews from Dr. Ma, and most of what he what is in here is what he had mentioned which i concur documentation and presentation excellent recording of serial vital signs and syncope upon hospital arrival use of toradol and protocol destination appropriate um the only thing i add is that there was nothing in the physical exam part of the chart so i don't know if that just got omitted or not but um anybody else So in the hospital, he um, initial vital signs were heart rate of 99, blood pressure of 92 over 76. He was diaphoretic. Um, the history or the complaints um, prompted imaging of his aorta where he had a ruptured 12.1 centimeter infrarenal AAA with a dilation of his thoracic aorta. He received blood products and they attempted to transfer him to Peace Health, but due to concerns for both a... Um, I wouldn't say a ascending, but both an upper aorta and a, a triple abdominal aorta injury. They thought that it was too complex that they could that they would be able to handle. So he got transferred to a manual, and um, they repaired repaired his aorta and was discharged in hospital day six. Doctor Mock, if you have any any more um, details that you want to share about his hospital course, feel free to. No, other than he he did well. Um, he came back into the emergency department like six days later, and like you know, brought everyone flowers and was um, incredibly grateful. Uh, awesome. Uh, no, I think uh, I I think the you know the documentation of that seemed to be being aware of that um, is uh, you know that, I mean that's uh, that's a key part of the pre-hospital care. No, I know you've got some teaching about it, so I'll no, go ahead with that. Awesome. Um, by any chance, do you know if he did like a endovascular repair or an open surgery? Because that's a pretty big um, aneurysm. Um, I, I'll have to double check. I'll oh, it's okay. I'll call off the top of my head. The only reason is just part of the little bit of the teaching. So um, <clears throat> triple A's, they're permanent. So in, in reference to the abdominal aorta, their permanent localized dilation of the abdominal artery at least 150% compared to the relative normal adjacent diameter of the artery. So pretty substantial enlargement. The prevalence is up to 3% in the population and the risk factors. The most common risk factor is atherosclerosis. Um, and then not necessarily in descending order, but hypertension, smoking, age, at least age 60, and then it seems to peak, uh, peak at either age 70 or 80, male predominance, Caucasian um, Caucasian race, high cholesterol, family history of AAAs, and history of prior dissection that you can think of as like either a patient that had um, asymptomatic aneurysm that they were monitoring and it, start, it got to the right size for them to intervene so they never caused a rupture or either, or a patient that has had, um, like this patient, a previous dissection repair to because of a uh, symptomatic. Um, and then, you know, we hear about, you know, don't forget about Ehlers-Danlos, but that's lesser of a con of a issue for it, but connective tissue disorders, cystic medial fibrosis, syphilis, and HIV, 
Um, if you guys follow locally, but actually across the country, syphilis is on the rise. So that might be more prevalent than our connective tissue disorder, but the number one most common is atherosclerosis. Then the information that I was able to find if you were a diabetic, um, female, black, Asian, you had less chances of having a AAA, interestingly. So why do they occur? It's um, related to the protein breakdown of the connective tissue in the vessel, um, specifically collagen and elastin. They don't know why that is um, failing. And then the rate of enlargement, it depends on the size of the aneurysm. A small aneurysm, so less than three, millimeter, three centimeters, um, will increase in size. Um, 0.5 centimeters per year potentially, but a large aneurysm, so five centimeters can increase um, in size from 0.5 to one centimeter in a six month period. So the larger the aneurysm, the more chances for it to take off and enlarge and rupture. So the presentation, most often from what I could find, it's usually asymptomatic and incidental finding for some other diagnostic study um, that it's enlarged, but it's not causing them any symptoms. So they monitor it until it meets a certain size. Um, but if uh, you're dealing with them as this is their presentation, you might find a pulsatile mass in their abdomen. They might be complaining of flank pain, abdominal pain, back pain. They can have GI symptoms if there is a fistula associated with it, um, or they can have urological complaints if it involves the viscera. <clears throat> when it's ruptured, the patient can present in shock or death. Um, they can also present with what seems to be like a GI bleed um, or an, like potentially heart failure if they have an aortocaval fistula where the aneurysm um, enlarges and causes irritation and erosion into the IVC and causes them to look like they're in ha acute heart failure. The diagnosis is uh, typically CT angiogram of the aorta, um, although you can do point of care ultrasound of the abdominal aorta, but they'll still want a CT of that to confirm um, the length, the size, and the location. And then <clears throat> Treatment, once it meets a certain size criteria um, or if it's ruptured, it's either more most commonly endovascular repair, which is pretty amazing because back in the day, I guess it was always open repair. And now they can do um, they have the option for endovascular and then they tend to do endovascular for uh, for medically chronically ill folks that they didn't think would survive an open surgery. And then for our protocol, I just pulled up the acute pain control. Um, so indications for acute pain control, we're going to be really expediting packaging and transport and preventing further exacerbation of their discomfort. Uh, we want to avoid using opioids in any chronic pain um, presentation, uh, also to include migraines. Um, Treatment, we're going to be using universal patient care protocol. We're going to ask for the pain scale, which this crew did. And they also asked for the scale after administration of um, pain control. And then consider and treat underlying causes of pain. Um, use non-pharmacological pain management, and that would be position of comfort, ice packs, verbal reassurance. And um, our, our category of non-IV pharmacological intervention Although two of the three here can be given IVs, just to help remember that this can be given as a non-IV option. So Toradol, 30 milligrams IM, uh, you cannot repeat it and you can't give it to anybody in cardiac chest pain or in um, a trauma entry. And it has to be a patient over the age of two up to the age of 64, and they cannot have known renal liver disease, allergies to aspirin and NSAIDs, pregnant, anticoagulation use, bleeding disorder, or trauma entry. and then. This other portion here is ultramental status, assuming that they couldn't tell you these this information above. Fentanyl, um, it'd be one mic per kilogram, and you could give an IM or intranasal, no more than 100 micrograms per dose, and can be given every five to 10 minutes for a total of 300 micrograms. And then if your camus fire nitrous oxide, I believe, is still in their protocol. Um, and then as for straight IV, so I know that this here talks about some IV dosing, but I'm just going to skip it to over here. 
So Toradol can be given 15 milligrams IV or IO, again, not to be repeated, not to be in a chest pain or, or a trauma entry patient, and not to be anybody other than 2 to 64 with lots of things that have met non-presentation, so not pregnant, not anticoagulated, not known liver and, and um, liver and renal disease. And then fentanyl, one microgram per kilogram, IV or IO, as mentioned previously. And then ketamine, only if you've given two doses of fentanyl already. Um, the ketamine dose is going to be 0 0.5 mg per kg, IV or IO, um, over two to three minutes for a max dose of 25 milligrams, repeated every 10 minutes until pain is controlled, unless the patient starts to show dissociative signs such as nystagmus, agitation, or ventilatory compromise. Um, if they do end up having emergency reaction um, presentation, you have the option to give Versed 2.5 milligrams. Um, and then if they're nauseated from any of these meds, the go-to, at least in our documentation, is droperidol, 1.25 milligrams IV or IO, halved if you're frail or elderly. Um, as for pediatric patients, we have Toradol and fentanyl as an option. Remember, you're never going to be administering more than an adult dose, and it's weight-based. And if the patient's in shock based off of their age, um, but they're appropriate for vital signs, then you're going to resuscitate them first. I agree with all that. I think particularly given the ketamine shortage, um, I would encourage you know encourage you to maximize the fentanyl right now. And then going just going back to this case presentation, um, I, I think the the biggest reason to bring this forward is just that back you know back pain in elderly patients is potentially severe. And I is by elderly, I guess I'm getting close to this age now. Um, I would say you know, really over age 55, um, anyone with vascular disease um, is at risk for having an acute aortic syndrome. Uh, they can present very subtly. A lot of times they can look like kidney stones. You can have this sudden onset of flank pain and you can have blood in the urine. Um, I, I just saw a patient working, I was working nights over the weekend, um, a 65 year old guy with a history of cardiac disease, you know, really pretty non-specific complaints um but it was this like chest pain or back upper back pain going to the shoulder blades going down to the low back and so it's that usually it's a combination of pain in one region plus pain in another region whether it's like back and leg pain or chest and back pain or um, upper and lower back pain uh those are those are risk factors um but just consider those as um, you know, those are those are high risk patients. Um, and then particularly if you have any episode of hypotension, even if it's transient, um, one of the American College of Emergency Physicians is putting out a new quality measure um, that essentially states that anyone presenting to an emergency department uh, over age 55 with um, with uh, belly pain or back pain that has an episode of hypertension needs to have screening for acute aortic pathology. So it's just it's just something to uh, to think about in these in these. It's a rare presentation, but it, it um, but we see back pain and we see uh, abdominal pain commonly, and um, and these are very time sensitive. Yeah. No. And there's a. I mean, there's always a case somewhere, right? But we had a case of, with Denver Fire where a very young person had passed away from a AAA on duty. And it made me kind of think, you know, is that, I mean, something so simple as like ultrasounding the abdomen, if that'd be part of like a screening, um, a screening test as the, all the things that we do for screening uh, health maintenance, <clears throat> if, especially if you meet the higher risk uh, population. Um, but the, I also put in the pediatric pain scale here. I think that it's really hard for peds to do, document their pain without this this option as a picture to kind of um, compare how they feel. So if you don't already have that as access in your rig um, or on your med kit, I really recommend that you either have it um, with on yourself or be able to look it up as it's really helpful for kids to be able to point to something about their pain level when you're monitoring it. <clears throat> Dr. Gabois, we lost your screen again. 
Oh, excellent. Well, you know, I did the different way, and I, I've never done it before, so I kind of feel like I don't want to do it that way again, but I'll just do a screen and then just keep on updating. So here's the pediatric pain scale. All right, so on, unless anybody has any other questions, comments, thoughts about case two, I'll move on to case three. So case three is of a 77-year-old female. Um, EMS got called for burns. Um, they found the patient to be alert. Her airway was open, and they didn't think that she was um, going to be able to protect it, secondary to the angioedema that they could see from her um, from walking in. And then they noticed she was tripoding. Um, she was pink, warm, dry. There was no active bleeding. Vital signs were obtained two minutes after patient contact. Noted to have a heart rate of 82, blood pressure 159 over 88, and respiratory rate of 8. <clears throat> Her SpO2 is 56% on room air, but she's normally on 2 liters. There's some things about these vital signs that, you know, you, makes you pause. Like, why isn't she tachycardic? Maybe she's on a beta blocker. And why isn't she tachypnic? Is she getting ready to parry arrest? Um, this SpO2 is obviously low, but she's supposed to be on two liters. But those are just things that you're kind of like pause for a moment to kind of assess. Um, the past medical history is that she has COPD. She's on chronic oxygen requirements. She has a history of heart failure, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Um, her meds that were reported were torvastatin, carbidolol, maybe that was the source for her lack of tachycardia, acetylopram, isosorbide, lisinopril, and spironolactone. And the history was provided by the granddaughter. She said that her the patient had fallen asleep smoking a cigarette in bed with her nasal cannula oxygen on, and that was approximately 20 minutes prior to EMS arrival. Um, the patient was in bed when they found her with... Um, with the bedding was previously on fire, uh, including her nasal cannula, her pillow, her um, bedding, in that the granddaughter was able to put the fire out and aired the aired the room that the patient was directly in out, although there's documentation in the chart that um, the rest of the house was pretty smoky still. <clears throat> uh, EMS got this call at 2349, and there's a lot going on, um, a little bit because they ended up transporting out of our county, so they had more time with them, but at two minutes, they uh, obtained those vital signs that I just reported to you. Um, as I mentioned, the house was smoky. They noticed that the patient was drooling. She had singed nasal hairs, charred skin to her chin and her nose. She appeared to be in severe respiratory distress, and she had second-degree burns to her face in what looked like angioedema. Um, they put her on a nasal cannula at six liters and then a non-rebreather at four minutes at 15 liters. They required two people to try to hold her to start a line as she was combative. Um, they gave her 500 cc's of IV fluids. At seven minutes, they noted that her SpO2 had normalized to 98% and tidal was 97. At 12 minutes, um, another set of vital signs, heart rate 82, blood pressure 183 over 94, respiratory rate of 12, room air sat, or sorry, SpO2 is 99% on her non-rebreather and her end tidal was 77. Um, based off of her initial presentation concerns for airway compromise or impending airway compromise, they elected to RSI her. They gave her 20 milligrams of atomidate. At 13 minutes, they gave her 100 milligrams of succinylcholine, and they RSI her first pass with video laryngoscopy and uh, bougie. At 16 minutes, they placed her on the ventilator. Um, we don't currently have, as far as I know, guidance on ventilator management, so... Uh, they documented pretty pretty extensively of uh, the settings for her. Um, do you want me to cover those, Dr. Mock, on what they set her up, or just leave that? I think we will, I'll go into more detail on that and piece that next month. Sure. So I think we can pass on that for now. Yeah, 18 minutes into the call, they gave her 50 micrograms of fentanyl, which was five minutes after intubation. And at 20 minutes, they gave her five milligrams of Versed. They initiated transport at 22 minutes. Um, they, because of the burns that she had sustained, they were going to be transporting to Emmanuel directly. 
Um, at 22 minutes, her heart rate was 55, her blood pressure was 104 over 67, respiratory rate uh, assisted was 14, SPO2 of 97 and title of 68. At 25 minutes, they placed a second IV. At 32 minutes, she started to develop hypotension. Um, so heart rate of 49, blood pressure 83 over 52, respiratory rate of 16, uh, intubated and ventilated at 97% and title 55 and a blood glucose of 165. Mm -hmm. If anybody is um, not muted, would you mind muting yourself? I would do it, but I'm not sure if I'd lose my screen again. Thank you. And at 34 minutes... We got it, Jackie. Thanks. All right, can you still see the screen now? Yep. Okay. At 34 minutes, another dose of fentanyl was given to her at 50 micrograms and another set of vital signs at 37 minutes where she was bradycardic and hypotensive. Um, <clears throat> they got a 12 lead, which appears to have a wide complex, but not tachycardic and no clear uh, STEMI in regards to that, although it's a strongly consideration based off of her age and her um, stress. Uh, they gave her 0.5 milligrams of atropine for her bradycardia at 43 minutes. They um, started her on a, an epi drip. I'm not sure if it was epi or norepi, but they documented it as epi drip. At 45 minutes, um, they said that she was bucking the tube. They felt like they couldn't give her more R RSI because of her vital signs. So they gave her paralytic 35 micrograms, uh, milligrams of rocuronium. At 49 minutes, uh, they gave her another dose of uh, fentanyl. And at 53 minutes, they arrived at the hospital. I think one more EKG here, which is largely unchanged, um, still showing no clear evidence of a STEMI or any other major arrhythmia. There was no Pulsera report um, because they went to a non-Pulsera hospital, but they did document uh, code red. So in uh, review... Could I... Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, just, just don't... Because the hospital used to use the, the phrase um, code red to refer to fire. Just uh, we don't say... We just say red acuity. Uh, the, the hospital... I've uh, had the hospitals get confused or worried if we use the words code red. Red acuity patient. No, that's a good point. I'm only reporting what they document in their narrative, but it's um, it'd probably be interesting to see if uh, I think the crew that had this call um, is on the call. Did did or on this uh, meeting? Do you want to put in the chat or unmute yourself to see if um, that you were there? Was there? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter, but know that there could be confusion. <clears throat> so in reviewing this case, I thought that this was a well-managed high probability for thermal injuries involving airway based off of assessment. They were aggressive in pre-oxygenating her. They were successful in intubating um, as you really don't want to be flogging the airway, especially if there's edema or concerns for trauma in addition to a heat injury. They did serial vital signs. They didn't miss the blood glucose, which can often be missed when you don't think it's contributing. Um, they did supportive treatment, um, atropine impressors, they got 12 leads, they got second line, they considered um, post-intubation sedation options and management as they were trying to um, balance her being sedated, but also balance her in being in shock um, and fighting the tube, which potentially could lead to more agitation or dislodgement of the tube. The hospital destination based off of their assessment and documentation that they, in their narrative, that they wish that they had placed the defibrillator pads, um, knowing that she was at risk of uh, compromise just by her age and her other comorbidities. Um, areas for improvement. Um, you know, they say don't give succinylcholine in burns. Um, these are usually more significant burns. So that's why I put question mark. More significant burns and usually not immediate um, presentation. So ideally, um, 
take pause if you're reaching for succinylcholine in a burn patient, but know that it's usually not the immediate presentation in more substantial burns. According to the crew, they had discussed not using succinylcholine, but the concern was paralyzing her for a longer period of time and not being able to get her airway. So I think that the decision-making is fair um, if you're worried about a difficult airway. And then atropine dosing is one milligram, not half a milligram, which they also had mentioned that they were aware of after the fact. Um, I think that, you know, we really don't like to see paralytics just um, just to be given to facilitate transport after intubation, but I think that this particular crew recognized that they were trying to weigh the pros and cons of all their options, and that's, so I don't, I don't have that in the areas for improvement. Is there anything you'd add, Dr. Ma? No, I, I would just say go go heavier with the pain control and the sedation, and don't use pain as a presser. Um, like you know, this I mean, this patient had I believe like 150 micrograms of fentanyl. You know, she's got burns, painful. Yeah, uh, there's room there's room for more sedation here, and you know, and then if you're concerned about heart rate and blood pressure, just just go up on the epi. Um, and again, I, I you know don't want you to lose the tube, but if you're gonna if you're gonna give the rock, then I mean, and they followed it with more fentanyl, but follow it with more with more Versed. Go up on the epi if you need. Um, you know, treat the treat the hypertension, the bradycardia with epi. You know, and I think the only thing that I would say for myself is that given the age of this patient and her comorbidities, I would say nor epi, but the epi would cover the the bradycardia and the hypotension where the norep would be more um, beneficial for just the blood pressure control. Um, but that would just be me because I wouldn't, I'd be a little hesitant to, I mean, these are small doses recognizing and the titratable, but I'd probably myself do norep. Um, I think okay. either would work here. Yeah. yeah, I think either would too. I just, as a preference for me, um, but obviously you can skin a cat more than one way. So hospital course in the emergency room, Her she was acidotic, but not as acidotic as our first case, uh, pH of 7.19. Her PCO2 was 96. Her carboxyhemoglobin was 4. Um, if you're familiar or have dealt with carboxyhemoglobin, a person who doesn't smoke, it should be 0 to 5%. A smoker can be up to 2 to 10%, and then usually it's considered pathologic or a risk for carbon monoxide poisoning if you're 9%, so not a not a concern for carbon monoxide poisoning for this patient. She was admitted to the ICU in respiratory failure, hypoxia, and undifferentiated shock, um, as well as bradycardia and an acute kidney injury. Uh, due to concerns for her undifferentiated shock, she was also treated with pressors for um, potential for sepsis. Um, Byrne was consulted. They made some topical recommendations for her um, face and uh, steroids for and bronchodilators for her underlying respiratory issues. She continued to be on IV fluids and pressors in addition to antibiotics. On hospital day four, she was extubated. In hospital day seven, she was discharged. Um, this was a few months ago, and since reviewing this case, um, she's had multiple hospital presentations and is currently on hospice for the folks that had ran her. So <clears throat> this was a referral from um, one of your colleagues, one of the paramedics, um, wanted to talk about the known but rare instances of um, flash burns from use of oxygen and smoking. So <clears throat> um, I did a little bit of search and specifically uh, there's data and information and studies about flash cigarette burns. So it's when a patient lights up a cigarette while on home oxygen and ignites. The good news is that the research shows that it's usually pretty self-limited um, as the nasal cannula oxygen might catch on fire, but as it melts, it pulls away from the face and the burns are usually limited to what you can see externally. Um, so the mechanism of injury is rapid combustion of cigarette and sometimes nasal cannula, but generally self-limited. The treatment of burns are generally topical care. They don't usually require skin grafting in that the airway edema risk is low. In one study, they did report of 89 patients in a retrospective study that 22% had 
airway edema. So not a, not a zero, but a low risk in general. And that was, I think, a 10-year period. Um, so it doesn't appear to be at high risk for delayed swelling or loss of airway um, in the imminent future. And then management is usually treating the underlying lung disease for why that patient's on oxygen in the first place, as well as any anxiety and pain that the patient has and the importance of serial reassessments. Um, they definitely can appear pretty pretty horrific, uh, depending on how much burns burn to the tissue. I think in this particular case that this crew had that they you know, they, rec they saw the patient was tripoding, they saw that the patient was altered, um, they saw that there was edema to the to the tongues. I think that the rationale for their decision making um, as a case by case basis makes sense. And then in my search for this stuff, I thought there's an opportunity to Portland Fire put out a little in, in conjunction with the manual, put out a little video and I thought we could watch it. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Joseph Polito, and I'm a surgeon here at the Oregon Burn Center, and I've been in practice here now for over 35 years. We have seen multiple patients who have come into the hospital here due to uh, injuries to their face, nose, and upper airways from smoking while they're on their own oxygen. I think this is about 10 years old, though. When they smoke with that home oxygen and that oxygen ignites, they end up suffering a burn to their nose, facial area, which can also affect their upper airway, but they end up on a ventilator for perhaps weeks at a time. We all know how flammable oxygen is, and uh, you put not only yourself at risk and suffering a burn, but you're actually putting your family members at risk in the same home. Family members who allow their family member to continue to smoke while on home op oxygen is giving themselves a risk. They're placing themselves and their loved one at risk all the time. All right, thanks for your guys' attention on that. Mm, think. Nope. All right. So for our local protocols, um, respiratory distress seem to be the most appropriate um, category, and they talked about upper airway obstruction, but this is not quite the airway obstruction that I think that we're referencing. So this would be like a foreign body in this, um, in this case, it would be their own anatomy um, causing edema. But um, in the notes and precautions, uh, aggressive airway management, including early intubation is appropriate for the patient who does not respond to treatment or is rapidly deteriorating, which I think would fall under this category. Um, in regards to burns, um, there's a lot in here about burns. So I thought I kind of hit the high points. Um, treat shock if the patient's in shock, remove any jewelry so that it doesn't end up becoming an issue as this area becomes more edematous and identify um, what type of burns that these patients have suffered. Determine the, um, determine the body surface area. And I forgot to mention if you have a CO detector, it might be worth getting an initial reading. And then knowing the criteria to go to a manual. So any partial thickness burn that is greater than 10% of the BS, uh, body surface area, any um, burns that involve the face, the hands, the feet, or the genitalia, um, or major joints, full thickness in any age group, electrical burns, including lightning, chemical burns, inhalation burns, burn in patients with pre-existing medical conditions that could complicate their recovery, and burns in patients that have trauma in which burn injury poses the greatest risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, yeah, and then don't forget to cool the burn, manage their pain, and that is what I have for the most part. Um, you can obviously review your burn protocol as it's multiple pages long. Anybody have anything else before our last case?
on this case. No, I just appreciate okay. the decision to intubate early in this case. It's, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you know, the other point too is that, you know, in the studies that I was reading, um, the main article was an MCRIT article um, that was giving the 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 review of that these tend to not be um, pretty extensive, but in the art in the research articles that they were referencing, most of the time they talked about extubating the patient within 24 hours, and this patient wasn't extubated until four days later. So, kind of also highlighting that this patient was a bit different. All right, and then as par part of um, case reviews, we'll be showcasing one refusal that in this case could have been done a little bit differently, but it can be good or bad, I, I believe, right? Excellently ran and areas for improvement. I think so. But anyways, 13 year old male. Yeah, no, I think we just want to, I mean, we know these are, we often talk about critical patients, but you know, refusals are some of our highest risk calls. So I, I think they deserve attention. Yeah, and I think that, you know, what I was saying is like, they don't have to always be that they could do something better. Like this particular one is that there was area for improvement, but I think that I might end up presenting cases like refusals where it was well managed. So it doesn't always have to be bad, right? Or not bad, areas for improvement. No, of course we learned from everything. Okay, yeah, of course. Anyways, um, case of a seizure of a 13-year-old, uh, EMS arrived to find this patient awake. His airway was open, he was protecting, his skin was pink, warm, dry. He had a strong regular pulse without any active bleeding. Um, there was a delay in getting vital signs as the patient was not cooperative. Um, heart rate was 140 when they did get it, blood pressure 130 over 70, respiratory rate of 20, and room air stats of 97%. Past medical history for this child is autism. Um, unclear about um, how high functioning autism, autistic he was, uh, as in it's not sure if this was his true baseline versus postictal. No meds were reported in that this was a witness seizure while he was sitting on the couch with his father, lasting for two minutes, no trauma associated with the seizure, and the patient was at his normal state of health before the seizure occurred and no history of previous seizures for this child per the um, reliable parent. So they got a call at 7.41 p.m., the vital signs, um, as I just reported, and then they also got a blood glucose of 117. They attempted another set of vital signs at 12 minutes, heart rate now 130, no blood pressure, no respiratory rate recorded, but an SPO2 of 97%. Um, they documented, so most of this I have pulled out of their documentation, so that the, act, the child was acting slightly more confused than baseline. There was no recent illness or trauma. Um, they stated that it was difficult to assess due to autism postictal, and that when the patient was with the dad and they were not trying to assess the patient, he was calm, but if they tried to assess him, he'd scream and cry, and that the father had decided that he wanted to go by a private vehicle. Um, they documented in the italicize that they advised of the risks and the possibility that the patient could start seizing again. The safest transport to the hospital would be via ambulance. And they advised that an EMS evaluation does, and they put this in their chart, so um, assuming they also gave that information to the father, advised that an EMS evaluation does not replace that of a hospital evaluation. And um, the refusal form was signed. The crew ensured that the patient got into the car safely and began transport. Patient's father was advised to pull over and call 911 if anything changes. So I think like, you know, they did a lot of, you know, a lot of getting a full set of vital signs, attempt for a serial set of vital signs. They documented um, a, a lot into their chart, which the advised that an EMS evaluation does not replace. I see that quite a bit in other refusals, so I don't know if that is, you know, kind of um, taught as well, but it doesn't seem like that's uh, infrequent. And there's nothing in the pulse area because they weren't transported. So like I was mentioning, serial vital signs, blood, glu blood glucose check and documentation, um, the only thing for area of improvement is that I think we all agree that this child should be evaluated and that we're saying that it'd be best to go by ambulance so this meets the criteria for online medical control cons contact. 
Um, <clears throat> because the non-transport of patients protocol is very similar in some components to the patient refusing care, I'm going to skip by that. Um, so in starting out your patient refusing protocol, um, you're going to be determining if a medical need exists and if the patient is refusing or resisting care, if they make their own decisions or if they're not capable of making their decisions. So I guess let me impress on you guys why a first time seizure should come to the hospital. This is not a less than five year old febrile kid, which even a first time febrile seizure should be uh, recommended to come to the hospital. This is a older child who has had a first time seizure um, the concern is that there might be a space occupying lesion as like a tumor that had led to um, this child seizing. So first time seizures get first time seizures generally, I shouldn't say always, generally get imaging of their head to make sure there's no bleed, there's no non-accidental trauma, there's no obvious tumor with um, midline shift or edema associated with it. They typically get a set of vital signs to or a, a set of labs to ensure that it's not electrolyte related with this kid's autism. I'm not sure if he might've gotten into something um, that could have been toxic and that the labs would be helpful for that. And then we tend to do urine drug screens for older, but that might be something the case because the, the potential for a seizure might be withdrawal. Um, and then um, if they have any, they typically don't get started on antiepileptics unless there's some unusual presentation, but I generally talk to neurology um, about these patients, especially for this age, to make sure that they get the follow-up that they need with a neurologist based off of if they need to go to a pediatric center as an outpatient. They don't typically get admitted, but they do typically come to the emergency room to get worked up. So this would be a patient that has a medical need and that you would recommend immediate care or ambulance transport. And although this crew did almost everything, the one thing that is omitted here is the consultation with medical controls mandatory. And then the other points I want to um, talk about besides that is that um, anybody that has medical need, the form needs to be filled out by the, the form, as in the electronic medical record, at least in our documentation, needs to be filled out by the paramedic in charge, not the EMT. Is there anything else that you guys would add? No, I just said, and the reason for getting the paramedic involved there is, like I said, these are some of our highest risk cases. Um, I do really appreciate that in the documentation here, the the crew is really specific about what the risks are and what to do if things change. Those are real strengths for the documentation. Um, that this is, there's the specific reasons that we recommend ambulance transport, and this is what to do if you know the plan that you're choosing doesn't doesn't go as planned. So that's a those are both real strengths here. Mm -hmm. There's something else I thought Do we need them to. Yeah, I don't know where it was. Oh, I think it was in this section. Um, no, I wasn't sure if there was like because I see some of the same documentation as this. Um, advise that EMIS evaluation does not replace. I wasn't sure if there was mandatory parts of their documentation that need to be um, in line with the protocol, but I thought I saw something, but I think that I just misremembered it. But yeah, you document what you can defend in what you said and did, so. Oh. No, that's not it. All right, that's all I have um, in review. <clears throat> so whippets, nitrous oxide is a common um, drug of abuse and um, that uh, it's usually transient. It tends to be maybe in the realm of safe um, in regards to all the potential complications of the other drugs of abuse, but uh, there's definitely some side effects of this that are short-term and long-term that can be detrimental to a patient. A uh, patient that presents with back pain, especially if they have particular risk factors of atherosclerosis, male, Caucasian, over the age of 60, um, they can present with back pain, abdominal pain, flank pain, 
or urological symptoms or even GI bleeds. So high, high index of suspicion. Um, patients that uh, cause burns accidentally because of smoking on oxygen, they tend to be more limited to what cutaneous um, based off of the studies and that support of their underlying airway um, pathology would be probably the most advantageous, although evaluate your patient and recognize if there's um, signs or sequela of more significant burns that need to be managed. And then um, in regards to patient refusals, make sure that there's a medical need if they make their own decisions or if they don't make their own decisions. And if you recommend that they come by ambulance or if they um, recommend by another means that uh, you meet the protocol for when online medical control needs to be consulted or not. And that is all that I have. And if you like the outdoors, um, Syncline has all their flowers in bloom right now. Thank you guys for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gadbois. Thanks. Have a great rest of your morning.